Hi, I'm Bob Harrington from Stanford University, and I have the privilege of serving this year as the American Heart Association president. We're here on day two of the American Heart Association scientific sessions. I'm joined by my friends and colleagues, Dr. Donald Lloyd-Jones, the chair of scientific sessions programming. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. It's great to be here. Manesh, the vice chair from Duke University of Scientific Sessions Programming, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Excited for day two. You guys have put on a great show. Day one was amazing. Blockbusters all the way through. Now, day two, I think it starts off equally as good. It starts with you. Well, not exactly, <laughs> but it does start with the opening session. And now, I want to turn it to you, uh, not the opening session, the presidential session. Yeah. I'll turn it to you, DLJ, because you've been tweeting, hashtag, you got to be in the room where it happens. For months. And it's going to happen. What does it mean? Yeah, so what it means, Bob, is everybody's coming to the presidential session to hear your speech. However, <laughs> if they do come, they get In case they weren't going to come. In case they weren't going to come. Of course they were going to come. But, uh, but, but uh, just as an extra teaser, um, we, uh, through AHA, have been able to secure three actors from the Broadway show Hamilton. So we have a Hamilton, a Burr, and a Washington who will be on stage at the presidential session uh, performing six songs from the smash hit Broadway musical Hamilton. Um, and we thought this was just a really nice way to acknowledge that we're here in Philadelphia, birthplace of our nation, and we wanted to kind of pick up some of that heritage, some of that vibe. I think it's a fantastic idea. I'm so excited for this. There's going to be, let's be clear, three songs before I speak and three songs <laughs> after <laughs> right. I speak. So let's <laughs> nobody <laughs> leave. That's right, exactly. You got to be in the room where it happens for the whole time. Yeah. But we are going to have some interesting discussions. You know, part of uh, being able to give this speech is that you get to talk about things that are important to you, things that you've spent a lot of your career thinking about. So what I've chosen as my main theme is this concept of evidence and the fact that evidence matters. Not surprising, as a clinical researcher, I wanted to uh, have that as a point of emphasis. And we'll also weave into it a lot of the things that, uh, that AHA is doing in this space to really try to send the message that we need more evidence, we need higher quality of evidence, and we also need to nurture the next generation who's going to provide that evidence for us throughout the course of their career. So I do hope that people uh, come on by. Some other great things in the session is that we have the leader of the fourth industrial revolution for the World Economic Forum. Therefore? Yeah, yeah, I noticed you tweeted about that. that like, what, what happened to the first three? <laughs> exactly. But in the fourth is really, again, one of the highlights of the meeting. It's about genetics and privacy and, and data, yeah. data yeah. and digital. digital. Wow, that dovetails w nicely with health tech. Yeah, and the health tech forum will be a really exciting time, too. And we have a, an actual place where people can go into uh, innovations in health tech on the convention floor to see some of those things going on. And then we have late breakers. And our, our first late breaking session, Bob, is going to be a, an interventional blockbuster again. I think there's sort of four really unique kind of topics. Uh, the twilight trial, which started to ask, can we drop an antiplatelet agent? And in this case, can we drop aspirin and see if we kept the P2Y12? And uh, we heard that data earlier this year. And we're going to hear about the ACS population, that highest risk population, another clinical conundrum. And I, you know, our interventionalists get a lot of heat sometimes for not following the data. But think about this. 10 years ago, everybody in shock, you opened up all the arteries. If you didn't have shock, you only opened up the IRA. Now, we know from complete, if you're not in shock, open up all the arteries. And if you're in shock, just open up the IRA. So we've done the trials, and complete's going to be showing us the OCT data to say, who should we be, and how do we think about those other vessels? I, I think there's also more on culture scene. We heard a little bit about it on day one. There's going to be a PCI trial. I think it'll keep putting the story together. And finally, something I think is going to lead to a lot of conversation, observational data on the use of these mechanical support devices, impella and balloon pumps, and how does that work, and how, how, is it helping patients, and what kind of evidence to your presidential grand rounds, is sort of what are we going to need? Yeah, and, and we don't have the trials, but these are very large observational registry studies, and I think people are going to be interested to see what they show. I think it'll, it'll help us uh, both as clinicians and as the AHAs think about what kind of studies we do. Well, interventional cardiology is so central to the practice of what we do, whether it's coronary disease, structural heart disease, heart failure, and really the selection of trials helps cover the waterfront there, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, the acute care cases with, uh, with things like complete, also that really difficult conundrum of antiplatelet therapy, yeah. and then the support devices. Yeah. What, what actually works, what doesn't work, is one better than the other, We're et cetera. To learn, yeah. 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 The other late breaker that we have uh, today on day two is actually uh, talking about controversies in heart failure management. We have so much new data, uh, particularly from two drug classes that will be highlighted in this session, 
first on SGLT2 inhibitors, even more data from the DAPA-HF trial, understanding how does it work across the age spectrum and are there quality of life differences in the patients who get da uh, the dipagliflozin versus placebo. So I think that's going to round out some of our understanding of those, uh, those data. And then also digging deeper on ARNIs, the secubitril valsartan story. Um, uh, we've had Paradigm, now we've had Paragon, Paragon is pretty much wide open to interpretation with yeah. that marginal p-value. Um, I think we're going to learn a lot more from these presentations about are there differential effects in men and women? Uh, and also um, uh, taking a deeper dive across the full spectrum of ejection fraction. So combining Paradigm and Paragon to understand. And then a really nice wrap up, how do we put all this together in managing patients with heart failure that Clyde Yancey is going to provide? One of the things I really like about this session is that we're looking at what I'll call the totality of the data approach. That you get little pieces presented here and here. Now we're going to bring it together and having a master clinician, a master clinician scientist like Clyde put it together for us, I think will be yeah. enormously helpful. Yeah, that's going to be a great session. Now, extending the heart failure observation, an area that's gotten enormous um, interest over the last year, year and a half, is amyloid heart disease. We've got a whole session on that. We have a whole main event session on that yeah. uh, in the morning today. And I think, as you said, you know, we, we now have a much better understanding of just how common this is. This is in your practice, no question about it. You have a patient with amyloid heart disease, whether you know it or not. And now we've got diagnostic tests we can use. We're starting to think about what therapies are appropriate. Uh, this is this is a session for clinicians uh, and they really need to be in it. And yeah. it certainly goes with our personalization theme again, right? Like we've known it maybe, we maybe didn't pay as much attention, but now that we have therapies and we have specific therapies, we're starting to really hone in on how to find these patients. And more therapies coming, so it really is a great time to understand the disease and begin to think what are the treatments we can offer our patients. Thinking about a disease that, or therapy that we've thought about for a long time, aspirin, and Manesh has already alluded to this, here's a therapy that we used to think, whoa, can't touch that, that's the backbone. That's the foundation. Let's build on it. Now we're saying, ah, oh, we can drop aspirin, keep the ADP inhibitor going. Oh, we can maybe use an ADP inhibitor, an anticoagulant. Now people are saying, maybe we don't need aspirin at all. Yeah. Well, and we certainly saw earlier this year with the, the new primary care, uh, primary prevention guidelines, uh, really pulling back on the numbers of patients who should be on aspirin for primary prevention as well as a result of, of a lot of data in the last 18 months. So this session is going to focus on aspirin, who really needs it anymore. And there are clearly patients out there who do need it still. Um, but uh, but the, the waters are muddy, and I think this will help clinicians kind of wade through where the evidence yeah, is. Yeah, I think a great session to sort of end day two or think about day two is to say, aspirin, something we really believed in and still do, but now where do you use it? So fantastic day yesterday, fantastic day today. More to come tomorrow. Excited you bet. About All right. Three. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for joining us here at Scientific Sessions in Philadelphia.